Dr. Ian Weinberg. Welcome to the Thought Lab podcast. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure having you here. Do I refer to you as Ian? Do I refer Absolutely. to you as Dr. No, Weinberg? No, please, I'm Ian here. I'm Dr. Weinberg in other places, but here I'm Ian. Here you, Ian. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll do that. Ian, you are an, an exceptionally fascinating individual. And I mean, during the podcast, we'll, we'll, we'll really get into what it is that you're actually involved in. But for now, I mean, and, and for starting off, you started off um, um, at Fitz Medical School. That's right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and you focused on neuro. Well, I became, had to become a doctor first. And, and there, there's the biggest uh, joke of the lot because it goes back to school where um, I decided I was inspired by reading a book called Passions of the Mind by Irving Stone. And I was totally inspired to get involved in this thing called neuro. And was so naive, I was sort of... Um, my academic situation was in tatters. Uh, I wasn't really a, a scholar as such, barely passing. Really? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Is this in school? Absolutely. Oh, wow. And so barely passing. You mean there's hope for me? <laughs> there's, there's hope for everybody. <laughs> After this, there's hope for everybody. And um, read this book and suddenly clicked, this is it. I'm into this brain stroke consciousness thing. It's, the, it's basically on the life of Sigmund Freud. Okay. But being a very physical guy, I'm hands-on. For me, it equated into brain consciousness, hands-on equals neurosurgeon. Oh, wow. Okay. So, in fact, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon before I wanted to be a doctor. And really? Then made, yeah, and then made this sort of um, what I thought was a dramatic um, statement at school to my buddies, saying that uh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to neurosurgical school. And they said, and they laughed. And they said, <laughs> hang on, but you've got to become a doctor first. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going straight to neurosurgical school. <laughs> the ignorance of the years. So, uh, to my absolute horror, I found that I had to become a doctor first. And uh, it meant I had to start getting some decent grades. Yes. And which is what I did. I don't know how I pulled it out, but I did and uh, managed to get into medical school. And then throughout medical school, every time we did something with the word neuro involved, I just clicked. It was almost as though there was some kind of intrinsic resonance. And uh, I knew I was going to go the neuro route. I, in fact, knew I was going to be a neurosurgeon long before I even started medical school. And, uh, and that's what happened. So I finished and I graduated as a medical doctor. Yeah. And then did my obligatory army. In those days, we had to do two years army. Um, but in fact, I was one of only four in the country that split out two years. So I did the first year as a medical officer and then specialized in neurosurgery and then came back into the army as a neurosurgeon. So I was a, in, oh, wow. in my CV, I'm also a military neurosurgeon. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the neuro story. Um, but my real passion while all this was going on, my real passion was this thing called consciousness. Mm. And for me, for me, it, it was consciousness as it, e as it evolved out of the brain as such. But ultimately, it was going to go much, much further than the consciousness that we deal with in neuroscience or in, in neurosurgery. Okay. At any point, did you think in going into the, the social sciences? Or was it always just hands-on? No, hands I, I was hands-on. Look, I, I was always working with my hands. I'm a woodwork guy and very much hands-on and it, it was going to be neurosurgery it was not going to be neurology which was the yes the medical side of neuro it was going to be neurosurgery because i was in fact i am and you'll see you'll be able to categorize the, the entire medical profession into are they are they physicians or surgeons okay and 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 i was a surgeon right from the beginning okay i mean as far as i can remember i was learning to tie knots so uh, right. and, and that was like instinctive I, you didn't have to tell me if there was a piece of string or <laughs> it had a knot in it there i was starting to make knots so really i was a surgeon at heart right from the beginning yeah that's incredible you know and i i talk about this so much on the podcast but i mean i know i know 45 year olds who still haven't found that passion mm. you know and it's it's why i said to you we're gonna you know we'll discuss this because i'm yeah. so fascinated with this this why you know why some people intrinsically as you put it go into a certain field while others really stumble along quite aimlessly and quite directionlessly mm. um, in their life until mm. hopefully one day they stumble upon something yeah. called a passion or yeah. a purpose or alternatively sometimes never ever do. Yeah, look, it, it, it's, it is. And I, and I think it's a throw of the dice. I, 
I think in my particular case, it goes back even further. I mean, it goes back, and it's all in, in, in the book that you're probably going dis- to discuss later on, but it's in the, in the book. I, I was forced to, at a very early age, I was forced to start questioning some very basic facts relating to people's thoughts, their biases, their prejudices, their behaviors, their religions, um, death, um, you know, is there life after death? Is there consciousness after death? So I was basically circumstances dictated uh, dictated mm. that I would start questioning this stuff and this stuff all became the components of what was to become consciousness. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you mind me asking and do you want to answer what some of those things were? Yeah, yeah. I, it's in the book. It's, it's pretty okay. much in the public domain. Look, I, I had a highly religious Orthodox mother and, and like most very Orthodox people, it was very dogmatic and prescriptive and... Mm. And if you didn't toe that line, you were seen, you fell out of favor and you got punished. And, yes. And um, I saw this as a, a, an overwhelming prejudice um, that things should be so prescribed without allowing people to think about things and to have the freedom yes. to exercise their opinions and even their behaviors. Mm. And so, yeah, I was dealing with religious dogma and prejudice from a very, very young age. Mm. And I was pretty headstrong and was not prepared to just take it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's when I started this discussion. Well, the narrative, you want to call it the life narrative, yeah. started at a very young age when I was already... Self-actualization. Yeah, I was actually already trying to define what is this thing called religion? Um, does it have a place? Is it real? Is it authentic? Mm. Um are there different ways of practicing it? Um, can you believe in God without seeing it as part of a religion? Yes. So I was a young guy toying with some big concepts, but that actually, even though it was a bit of a curse at the time, because it sort of made me a little more serious than I should have been at that stage of my life. Sure. It did lay the foundations for actually a definitive path. Yeah, I'm with so you. So that became my And I think part. we have a very common similar- similarity there. Um, from a very, very young age, I was also uh, uh, brought up in a Christian home. And from a very young age, I really, really questioned. And I was very fortunate that my dad was, uh, and he has his degree in theology, you know, not because he wanted to be a pastor, but because he loved religion. Mm. And um, I was very fortunate that he was very open-minded with me. And he realized that my wires never stopped. My yeah. wires just permanently just went on and on and on. And at a very young age, he gave me a book by Eric von Duniken called Chariots of the Gods. Mm. And I read this book and it completely blew my mind. Mm. And from then, you know, um, I, I just questioned and I've always questioned. And, and, and I agree with you, you know, this, this idea of, of, of religious and, and does it have a place and, and, and can it fit? Can I still have this belief in something larger than me without falling into the dogma of a religion? Which is basically where I found myself, you know, and, and I'll never forget... I was very young and I, I, I actually don't recall if I've told this on the podcast before, but my uncle or, or at least a family member would come back from the Amazon and he would tell us these stories of these Amazonian people and I would, I would literally be emotional going, yeah, they're all going to hell. Yeah, he'd lead these scientific expeditions into, into the Amazon and I thought they were going to hell because that's what, that's what I was told yeah, and that's yeah. what we, we, we brought up yeah, to believe. Yeah. So I was highly emotional about these poor yeah. Amazonians and why they're all going to hell crazy world it really is yeah, yeah yeah i appreciate and i understand that for the longest time i think religion played a very vital role um, especially in humanity's formative years in terms of of i, I say the word control but just keeping people in line mm. because things were a bit savage way back in the day absolutely yeah i agree i i think it definitely had its place and um it did create some order um but unfortunately as we know um, it would inevitably be abused by those who of course. required the kind of power and influence that we still have today. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we have today in different forms, whether it be religious, political, economic. Absolutely. I mean, we still have the same thing. Power corrupts and absolute power absolutely. corrupts, absolutely. And it continues, and yeah. it will continue forever. Ab- you're never going to... Yes. This is the nature of the beast. Well, you think about it. Yeah, you, you take somebody like, like Donald Trump, which it's frightening that he is president, and, and I mean, he was the, he was the worst... Uh, the better of the worse you know that's how i see he came into power and you have one individual who plays twitter wars with kim jong-un and has the power to launch nuclear weapons one person one singular narcissistic individual Mm. that's frightening 
Yeah, but it, there's a much bigger picture, and I hear what you're saying, and that is the take, but there's a much bigger picture. Um, it was inevitable that he would come in. Um, he, he is the man for the times. Um, we are going to dismantle a lot of things. They're being dismantled. Uh, we need a wrecking machine. We needed a wrecking machine. Okay. This, is, this is the wrecking machine. Um, you know, obviously, the man himself is what he is. It's everything that you've just mentioned. But he's fulfilling a, a function. He's saying he serves a purpose. He, he definitely <coughs> does. And, and in fact, if you have the time, uh, get hold of a book called The Fourth Turning. Okay. The Fourth Turning is by uh, Strauss and Howe, which was written in the 90s. And it's, uh, it's a book based on a study of the last 500 years. And oh, wow. humanity goes through cycles, cycles. of 80 yes. years, which are broken up into four periods of 20 years. Okay. And the last turning, and they're called turnings, the last turning is the last turning of 20 years, which is the destructive period. And we have to go through these. We, we seem to go through these all the time, and they've gone back 500 years, that we're now in the wrecking process. Yeah. We're going to wreck everything and rebuild it. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you want to see exactly where we are, if you look at the last cycle, it's usually mo the, the last turning, the fourth turning, is usually marked by an economic implosion, global economic implosion. So okay. the beginning of the fourth turning of the last cycle was the 1929 crash. Um, the 29 crash coincides with 2008. So the fourth turning started in 2008. Okay. So we're now in the 30s leading up to the Second World War, the rise of fascism. Yes. Which we're seeing right now. Absolutely. So we're following exactly what the fourth turning is all about. Yeah. It's going to head towards global um, conflict. You, do, you, do you honestly believe that? Absolutely. It has to be. Okay. There's just too many megalomaniacs at the moment. Yeah, with, with, with trigger There's fingers. There's just too many. And, and it's, it's going to, the lines are going to start forming. And you've seen this over, what we got? We got five or six cycles. They've all been the same globally. So we're following almost exactly the same pattern. Now, the, it was the, 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 the war broke out in 1939, which was 10 years after the Great Crash. 2008, 10 years is 2018. Okay. So, so we're aligning with where they've previously had their global conflict. I see what you're lining saying. Lining up now. I see what you're and saying. And how did it line up? With the rise of uh, uh, autocratic fasc fascism around the world. Mm. That's exactly how it started. Yeah. So that's where we, we are. And, and, and there's a weird, I actually mentioned this to somebody that I was one of my clients this morning. I just said there's a weird, there's a weirdness in the air. Just, just a weirdness. If you look at what's going on in social media, if you look at what's going on in terms of freedom of speech, if you look at, at what's going on, uh, in terms of the, the left and, 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 and the far left and alt-right and, and the right and these divisiveness. I mean, it's, it's race and it's politics and it's freedom of speech and it's sexism and it's gender and it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy at the moment. Well, it, it, everything's being leveled. So, so there are no more sacred cows. Everything, <laughs> I like that. Everything now is subject to scrutiny, um, deletion, uh, or... or um, heavily hammered from now on nothing nothing is going to sit there untouched nothing sacred anymore no and no you're very right with that the especially with the rise now, of social the media the big problem is absolutely the big problem now is there are a lot of people who need a frame of reference so mm. people are losing their frame of references yes lost and if they lose their frame of reference if they don't have intrinsic um uh, resilience yeah can we call it intrinsic value systems it's more than that. It's, okay. it's actually a resilience to actually sit out a complete chaotic vacuum. That's really where we are at the moment. Okay. So if they don't have an intrinsic resilience, in other words, an internal map, an in, a, a degree of self-esteem, self-respect, yes, a value system, ethics, um, aspirations, meaning, purpose. Self-actualization. If they don't have these things, yes. in this kind of environment they are going to implode into, in many cases, sadly, a terminal existential crisis because people are going to become hopeless and helpless. Yes. And hopeless, helpless, which, by the way, is a concept which is heavily investigated and researched in, in the field that I'm involved with, which is psychoneuroimmunology. Yes. Um, 
is the one that's associated with um, chronic inflammation and all the illnesses that come from oh, it. Oh, really? So not just so it's not just the internal physical, but I think it also extends to the external physical because if I'm hopeless and helpless, then I'm in one of two states. Well, I don't care about my own life and I'm quite happy to take it. Alternatively, I'm quite happy to do whatever I can, whatever I can to change whatever I can regardless of the, the, the consequences. Talking about things like civil wars and and uprisings. Am I right? Well, look, look, if you're in hopeless, helpless, you're going to just go down a dark hole. That's all there is to it. Okay. If you can't be saved from a descent into a bottomless abyss, that's it. That's where you're going to end up. Mm. And you're going to you're going to terminate mm. because hopeless helpless is gonna which by the way is my term for degrees of depression these degrees of hopeless helpless because the word depression has never been adequately defined yes we, very we, much we, so. we know of it from what the psychiatrists talk about and but you know when it comes to the crunch you can't really um, define it for another person it it it, it, it it's specific it's to beyond you beyond definition but yes. The concept of degrees of hopeless helplessness we can understand. Mm. So hopeless means um, I don't see any meaning or purpose in what I'm doing. Um, I don't believe that it benefits me or anybody else. It's stressful. So that's the hopeless side of it. The helpless side of it is, and I don't see my way out. In yes. other words, I can't see an alternative. Correct. And if you put those two words together, you're in a black hole. Yeah. Now, if you don't save yourself from that by going through a process of uh, definition, self-evaluation, personal mission statement, and and reinstate your, your being and build into that specific meaning and purpose, then you're not going to be able to get away from the, the black abyss. Yeah. And so, yes, in this current environment, it's very, very easy if you don't have inner resilience, inner resources, um, it's very easy to be swept away in this current of chaos, of complete destruction of structures that form the frame of reference. Um, yeah, you're going to be swept away in this current, which is yeah. going to take you right into the deep sea. That's really where you're going. Yeah. Um, and so what it's all about is, yes, you have to now sit back, define, um, go through that whole process. Well, um, you said something very interesting. You said yeah. personal mission statement. Yeah. Now, um, I deal with both personal consultancy and I also deal with business consultancy. And of course, the first thing I do from a business is I sit down and I say, give me a mission statement, mm -hmm. give me a business plan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mission, vision, right? The, the, the how and the why and your business plan, which is the plan. Yeah. And then the next thing when I'm doing personal consultancy with, with certain individuals, especially at sort of director level or business owner level, I said to them, all right, now let's try and start aligning that with your personal mission statement mm -hmm. right and your personal value system and your your personal vision statement mm. and then let's transpose a business plan to life plan goals mm -hmm. you know short term medium term long term mm. the similarities are then what's what i always laugh about and it's and, and laugh and i don't mean that in in a, in a in a sarcastic manner but what always surprises me and we're willing to plan a light out with the ladies and we're willing to plan our businesses but we're not willing to do the same thing for our lives yeah uh look there's varying degrees so so the first thing is act out who you are and most people just act out who they are reflexly they never examine it so the concept of Quantify awareness that? well truth so act out your aware. truth so people are not aware okay so for the most part 80 percent, and this is a figure that comes from bruce lipton who's the father of epigenetics which happens to be a, a particularly interest area of mine and Bruce Lipton had made a little study and he fact showed that 80% of the world's population never ever think about thought or reflect about who they are and where they come from and where they're going. So really, so most that people many? act out their life's narrative yes. reflexly. Yes. So in other words, what they've got is who they are and for better or for worse, uh, they'll just act it out and, and never examine it or never ever question question will try and go above it okay as soon as you stop and get off the the train and then have a look at it you start moving into that space of awareness and awareness um, is the thing which evolves from looking at life with different eyes mm. so in other words it's the it's the first step in moving towards an objective state or a third person state 
or the meta state as they call it in NLP. So you would have to go into that state and start developing an awareness of, first of all, who you are, where you come from, where you're going, Mm -hmm. your environment, and then thereby you will then start evolving self-awareness, which has to be appropriate. First of all, you have to be authentically aware of who you are and and also be have an authentic awareness of your terrain, your environment. Okay. There has to be a match. And to be authentically aware of yourself, can you delve into, because that word... Uh, right, so these, these are three words. I mean, these are three words which are used very, very loosely. And exactly. And I want to, so, I want so to delve down into try. those words. I mean, it's a complicated subject. So there is um, self-actualization, authenticity, um, and... Um, yeah, self so and, 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 and self awareness. So the thing here is that according to Maslow, I mean you you reach a certain time in your life when you become self actualized. Yes, that's his last capstone. But what does it mean to be self actualized? Does it mean to be authentic? Right, fine, you're authentic. What does that mean? It means you're putting all of yourself out there, warts and all. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Um, so you've now self-actualized, you've come to terms with exactly who you are, you've got maximum self-awareness, and you're happy to put it all out there. Okay. But is, he, and he has a big question, is, are you really being an authentic human being if you are true to your shortcomings? In other words, so you've got a lot of deprivation in your nurture. Hmm. And um, and you've got a lot of deprivation-based behavior. You've got need to control, um, fear of failure, sure. um, low self-esteem. Um, maybe there's a degree of hostility and vengeance. Got you. These things will come out of deprivation. And now you arrive at a stage in your life where you have the courage to be authentic. Now. Does the courage to be authentic mean that you now have the courage to put your washing out there and say, well, you know what? I like to control and I will control. Yeah, I got you. Or um, I like to cause problems for other people. I have a certain hostility and I'm now doing it freely. Well, in fact, you are being very authentic. You're being very authentic to who you are. To your narcissism. That's exactly right. So the question now is, hang on a bit. So we're going around in circles here. We're talking about self-actualizing, right? I know who I am and I'm happy to do who I, to act out who I am. Got you. So I'm authentic. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm fully self-actualized. I know all the components that make, make me up, which is from my deprivation. I need to be in control. I like to be in control. And is this of benefit to yourself and mankind that you're now self-actualizing authentically? Got you. No, the answer is yes. no. It's not. A, it's not, not enough because you've got to be able to see the bad and step or make well, a plan. Well, the next level is awareness. Okay. And awareness of not just self awareness, but awareness of the greater reality in which yes. you find yourself. Yes, I agree. Which now moves into a universal awareness. Now, if you start becoming, and you can only get to universal awareness if you go into the meta state or the objective state. Now you begin to see yourself and the environment. Now you would move towards the state of awareness, which you might or might not integrate into who you are. Hmm. Some people say that just developing the awareness um, is arriving at full self-actualization. I would actually say arriving at authentic awareness becomes your mentor. And okay. that the final product it teaches you the lessons you need arriving, to know. If I had to take uh, Maslow's self-actualization, I would say, hang on a bit. Where you ended off was the end of a narrative, or the the courage to to live out your 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 the, the products of your narrative. But there's another step beyond that, and that is moving into this objective, universal, meta state and perceiving who I am, what the world is learning about processes universally and objectively yes creates an awareness of the greater environment of which i'm a part of but now if i apply that to myself and i now start um correcting or ironing out or modulating or mediating self-mediating then i'm applying that awareness as a mentor to myself yes now i elevate myself i transcend 
the limitations of my self-actualization based on my limitations of my deprivation and I transcend that towards something much more universally authentic. Yes. Now my self-actualization um, is true self-actualization. I've got you. That's on a broad and this is a very, yeah. very complicated concept. No, I, I couldn't very, agree more. Very, very complicated concept. So, I couldn't agree more, but, but you've got to, and I always say to people, you've got to get into a state where you're willing to do some self-identification. You know, and, and let's, let's, let's use a religious term, but you've got to be willing to go through the dark nights of the soul. You know what I mean? And really start questioning. And then, then once I've looked at myself going, okay, so there are certain things that are really good about me that I can enhance even further because I'm passionate about them. And there's certain things that are really, really bad. My plan needs to be how to fix the bad because for me, it's always about balance. And if you look at this wheel of life, you know, and if you look at everything around you, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, uh, family and friends, we've got to have this balance mm. because if we don't have balance, I'm of the opinion that work affects personal, personal affects work, family affects, it, it all affects everything. Mm. And I can't be mm. high on finance and low on family, mm. you know, mm. and I, I, I can, but to what detriment? Mm. You, you know, we've got a rule that we've made up on the podcast and you know, mm. that, that that's don't do anything short term that will harm yourself and others, mm. you know, and, and mm. it's also about the other. Mm. It's not just about yourself. It's too narcissistic in its, in its view. Well, um, you know, the, 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 here, and this is an article I just wrote. It's, it's very interesting. I, I write an article every now and then, put it on social media. And it's been a, it's been a series of articles. And by the way, this book um, that I've written is really a collection of most of my articles. Okay. And, and it's just basically been put into a logical sequence, a, a chronological sequence. Um, you know, I just wrote an article on, in terms of the current value system, and everything that the standard coach is coaching people in and the objectives that they're seeking, um, if you take an archetypal psychopath, okay, they check all the boxes of success. Of course they do. And so, so basically... That makes perfect sense that they check all the boxes. In this environment that we're talking about, this current 21st century environment that we find ourselves in now, we're almost selecting out as successful people your average psychopath. That's really what's coming. They check all the boxes. Yes. Charismatic, narcissistic, driven. Everything's there. And yeah. they're highly successful. And the question you ask yourself, um, yes, and they're going to be successful, but they're going to destroy people. Yeah. And uh, without any conscience whatsoever. And so, yes, things are going to be successful in the short term while they're in the driving seat and while they're deriving whatever they're deriving from the, the process. And you ask yourself, then what is the component that is missing um, and what are the implications of incorporating that component that's missing? And the thing that's missing is empathy. Hmm. So Which while we were rushing to become highly successful and wealthy and influential and, and recognized and adored and the whole story and wrecking other people in the process, yes. I see that happen. We just bring in one component and say, you know what, let's look at empathy. And what are the full implications of empathy? First of all, you can't become empathic unless you've got access to your emotions. Yes. Right, so your if your EQ. emotions are totally suppressed, you've got no access to your emotions. And people Agreed. who have severe deprivation in their nurture years, the pain of that nurture has caused them to suppress their emotions. So they don't mm. have access to those emotions. Absolutely. Most of our... Um, ethical compass our values and ethics compass um, is fed with emotional prompts and if we're not getting emotional prompts or you're not receptive to emotional prompts or mm. we don't recognize emotional prompts we're not going to have access to the emotion and we're not going to develop empathy if we're not going to develop empathy there's a major component for long-term sustainability of ourselves our personal environments and our business environments that is going to be missing from yes. the picture. So there I agree with you whole so, so that's the story. So the fact is empathy has been drowned out. And the worrying thing, another article I've written, the worrying thing is that AI, artificial intelligence, is heavily based on what we would call the left hemisphere, which is the driven strategic um, success space, um, is driven to enhance it even further while our sensitive, empathic, 
creative yeah. and all the softer stuff which is sitting in the right, right hemisphere, hemisphere is dominated. Yes. And all that AI is going to do, if except, first of all, AI can never, ever replicate. If you're going to take AI to its highest level, it will never replicate these human values yes. of emotion, I, I empathy. Agree more. And, I, so, and so AI yeah. is really not going to be a great... First of all, it can never emulate our consciousness, this, the, these emotions that I've been speaking about. Um, no matter how sophisticated it ever gets, it's going to really just make the left hemisphere a bit more efficient more data, more um, smart algorithms, uh, more efficiency, greater communication. And, and, and you're talking about AI in terms of, for argument's sake, the great AI engine that runs Google for argument's sake. Mm. Is that what you're referring to? That type of thing. So, so the artificial intelligence which is involved with data, data processing, yes. memory, Got you. applications and that type of stuff, that's not gonna make us more human. That's not gonna make us more successful. No. Because our greatest success comes from our empathy which is a, a link to our emotion and a link to a big picture sensitivity feeding on a very very broad spectrum at an intuitive level that's yes. where we innovate yes intuitive and sensitivity so you can figure I, I have absolutely no faith in AI as an end in itself in number one replicating all that we are conscious consciously which is in fact I essentially our right hemisphere and our left hemisphere we both basically yeah um, and all it's going to really do is enhance all these sort of psychopathic type requirements. Um, yeah. Not calling, calling them values, calling them functions. Yeah, because um, it literally is an electronic function that spits out data that we make a call on. But to what detriment to the human being, you know, at the end of the day? Well, it's going to, it's going to drown. If, if it's allowed to, it's going to just perpetuate these other functions at the expense of the things that really make us human, which is empathy. Um, empathy is one of the, the highest attributes of humanity. I mean, you can judge a people on their level of empathy. Yes. You don't judge a people on their level of psychopathy or their ability to to uh, efficiently deliver. You really, your, your, your lasting impression of, of a person or a group of people is their level of empathy. Mm. And it's, it isn't even part of some company's value systems. Mm -mm. at all I'm sure yeah I'm sure and and funnily enough as soon as it is things change as soon as you are sensitive to your people as soon as you're sensitive to their needs and by the way you can't be sensitive to their needs unless you're sensitive to your own needs <laughs> agreed so, so, so clean, empathy clean begins with self so self empathy is where it starts the fact that there is such a thing as emotion and empathy that's where it starts but then once you become sensitive to people their needs where they're at their fears their aspirations um, they feel it, by the way, and immediately they warm to you when they know you're sensitive to their situation. Of course, of course. Now productivity takes a leap forward tenfold. I couldn't agree as more. As soon as people are recognised for who they are and their trials and their tribulations, and if you reward them for their contribution, and from the sensitivity side, um, and the big picture, it's a big picture sensitivity. Um, you create space for them to be all that they are, obviously in the context of what the company correct, does. Correct, correct, agreed. You, you create the framework for them to be completely free within that framework. Absolutely. Yes. And so, so, so now we, we're moving from a prescriptive FIFO, my way, the highway story. <laughs> yes. Into an, a collaborative inclusiveness. Inclusive, yes. Now we're talking Absolutely. a completely different space. I couldn't agree In more. that space, you're going to be using your human resources to their maximum. Yep. Your intrinsic uh, internal human resource potential will un will become unpacked to its max. I agree. And 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 that's really what comes out of empathy. So these businesses which remain maybe by default in this prescriptive top-down um, fitting or get lost type of thing. Yeah. Um, as, as long as, and, and they're defaulting back in it because fear defaults you back into prescriptiveness. And to what you know. Because That's exactly yes. right. And so it's going to be anti-inclusiveness. Absolutely. But if you, if you go against the grain and say, hang on a bit, we're in a, we're in a rough time at the moment. Let's see who we are and what we've got. And let, let's look at our intrinsic resilience and resources and work out amongst ourselves how we can best go forward yeah. in other words share the load uh, delegate 
<laughs> and these are swear words in, a, uh, in many companies. Of course. I mean, of course. I have to delegate, take everything on myself. Delegate means to allow uh, Joe Soap to actually chirp. Yeah. Because in fact, in the current environment, in the current prescriptive top-down situation, if Joe Soap suggests something, that's Joe Soap chirping. And Joe Soap's job is not to chirp. Jo- it's to do what to you do need. what he yes. was told to do. Yes. And if he does it well, he gets his reward and his promotion. Absolutely. Well, this this old paradigm story is now a fossil. I yeah, couldn't it's a total agree fossil. more. It's a total I couldn't fossil. agree more. You know, when I'm speaking to, so I do a, I do a specific training session, which is largely based on why we form habits and addictions. And one of the first things I ask, and I'm giving it away for anybody that's ever going to do the training with me, but one of the first things I ever ask is, what is a company's biggest resource? And I hear all sorts of answers. The clients, the systems, the this, the that, the that. And, and then right at the end, and on the odd occasion I get the right answer, but right at the end I'll say no. It's the people. If I magically transposed and took everybody out of this building, there would be no company. Without the people, there is no company. And that's what it comes down to. That is your biggest resource. And then what is the biggest commodity? Time. That's what you've got. You've got your people and their time. And that's it. Hmm. And people don't want to be controlled. The more they are controlled, and the more that you can even refer that down to micromanagement, right? The more they feel out of control, the more they hate their lives and they hate what they do. And right now, I can tell you probably 90% of the people I know, not necessarily the businesses I consult with, but the people I know hate what they do absolutely hate what they do and we've always done things we didn't want to do but is that a result of of not doing the right thing or is that a result of being an environment that actually fosters that hate because of their systems or processes or antiquated ideas well your your figure is very accurate because in fact um i don't know which of the big uh, consulting companies it was in the states but they did a study what's it about three years ago now to look at levels of contentment, meaning and purpose contentment mm. in a job situation, in other words, job satisfaction for want Absolutely. of a better word. And only 27% of corporate USA is fulfilled That's in their work. That's frightening. The rest, which is, uh, my arithmetic gets me, 100% minus 27. <laughs> Got you. I forgot that you said 27. I was listening to what you are saying. <laughs> are basically only sit, sitting and working paycheck. to get their paycheck. Yeah. And that's it? That's it. So now if, if, if and now your figures are similar. So if we actually extrapolate this across the world, we're in a horrendous situation because we are saying that 70% of the world's population yeah. is merely existing for financial reward and that they either don't know what they would like to be doing or yes. don't have an opportunity to do what they would like to do um, because of prevailing economic circumstances. Of course, of course that's a factor. It's a massive so, contributing so, so, factor. But this is a big concern because... I agree wholeheartedly. If you're spending um, 80% of your awake time at, at a job, yeah. which you do not derive any significant fulfillment from, yeah. You might then become I'm hopeless afraid, and helpless. Then I'm afraid you have to extrapolate to, therefore, what's life all about? Yeah. Now, that's a very painful question. Of course. What's life all about? Well, I've been asking myself that since I can remember. What am I doing here? So, so, Why did I come here? <laughs> okay, so, so there we go. So that's a painful question. And by the way, that's a lethal question for many people. Yes. Because it can lead down dark rabbit can holes. Put them right down into the dark abyss. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, agreed. I mean, unless there's a safety net. Yeah. You, I jest about this dark nights of the soul, but I've been through it. You know, I've asked and asked and asked. And eventually, you know, because back then I was still religious, I was like, well, if, you know, if there's no answer and if I don't know what I'm doing, well, then what the what's the point of being here? Now, wow, that's, that's, mm. I mean, obviously mm. I didn't go that far, but I can very quickly see that in situations where there may not be a safety net, mm. that that can spiral into a hopeless, helpless goodbye. A terminal hopeless helplessness. Yeah. And it's happening. Yeah. Sadly, it's happening. It's happening as we speak. There is, look, people have always been born and died. There's a lot of, of dying. Of course. There's more dying now than before because there's a lot more people. So obviously the statisticians will tell you straight, well, don't tell me there's more people dying. But we see a lot more young people dying. Um, and we see a lot more people dying. I mean, you'll see one of the stories in my book is about death. So almost did a study of death. Oh, wow. Um, people die when they reach, and it's identifiable. You can identify when Joe Soap hit the skids before he died. You can actually see that. 
And when you say hit the skids, he 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 he, he hit, hit that hope, rock. He hit, hit that rock bottom. Terminal hopeless helplessness. Okay, and terminal hopeless helplessness. Yeah. And, and you mean physically died or actually took his physically life? Physically died. Well, it translates into illness as well. Uh, I see That's what you're saying. That's the whole of saying. psychoneuroimmunology. So psychoneuroimmunology has already tested all these. I mean, the research has been going on since the early 70s. Yes. So we've got data for Africa already. So we know exactly what's going on. So certain mindset, hopeless, helpless mind state, translates into certain chemistry in the brain. Um, we secrete certain things, one of which, by the way, is adrenaline. And then this goes out into the, the body, into the blood, and into the peripheral, which you call the peripheral part of the, the, the body, which is beyond the brain, where it triggers the production of inflammatory mediators okay. in the immune system. And the inflammatory mediators, by their very name, mediate inflammation in any target area of the body. Now, the worrying uh, stat, which is now become apparent to us over the last couple of years is that up to 80 percent of all illness is based on chronic inflammation yes uh, we, so, so we're talking here about absolutely inflammation itself yes joints bowel whatever we're talking about um coronary artery disease all arterial disease has an inflammatory foundation okay Alzheimer's has a strong inflammatory foundation and prevails throughout Alzheimer's. Really? Motor neuron disease has an inflammatory foundation and prevails throughout the condition. Most cancers have an inflammatory con uh, foundation. In fact, you invariably get a, a cancerous growth from an area which has been involved in a chronic inflammatory process. Okay. So, it just you just basically pull it all together and see immediately that a mind state that's lost in hopeless helplessness for a long enough period. My figures were 9 to 12 months. My contemporary in the States who did the early work uh, was six to, 12, uh, 6 to 18 months. So roughly a year common. Yes, 12 months that common. if you have a loss of anything and you go into hopeless helplessness, you produce the inflammatory mediators who will eventually give rise to a medical diagnosis. Mm. If it's not corrected, and you remain in and out of chronic hopeless helplessness, you're going to succumb to it. So to break it down into something that's so easily digestible, I think, dying of heartbreak. So you've, you've lived with your partner for 80 years and your partner dies and you die a year later. Well, that's a medical term, by the way. Yes. Broken heart syndrome is a syndrome. Oh, shit, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. So it's actually a medical term. is a syndrome. Really? So... Um, I can't remember their names. I think it was Kerry Fisher. The mom and daughter were both actresses. And the daughter died and mom died the next day with no known diagnosis. She just died. She died of a broken heart. So the broken heart syndrome is well defined. Okay. And even the chemistry is well defined. And the heart balloons out. Most people survive, but a few people succumb. To a Shit, I didn't know it was actually a physical. I was no, trying so to find a, a, okay, it. Wow. Got a, it's got a Japanese name and it's in my book somewhere. I've got broken heart syndrome in the book somewhere. And <laughs> it, it's got something to do with an octopus catching basket because the heart suddenly becomes as ballooning on the left ventricle and can be pretty lethal. Wow. And, and that's from a pure emotional upset. So you can die of a broken heart. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Absolutely. And so this thing called voodoo now becomes very real because if I can, if I am that influential in your life and you have been conditioned in your nurture and your life to regard me as all powerful and I'm sort of the the shaman or the witch doctor of the tribe and I've got that kind of standing if I say to you you will die by the end of the week you'll die by the end of the week yeah create that placebo effect and, and placebo is psychoneuroimmunology it's placebo is That's, real we so know it's that working, it's working through this chemistry so the chemistry works both ways so if you believe in something positive that you are strong and that you're protected and you're connecting to something much bigger you're going to prevail if you believe you're going to succumb because it was told by someone who knows that you're going to succumb you will succumb uh, how does the science work do you mind going in can we go into that no, science is very straightforward because you you're talking about something that that many people many years ago there was a book called the secret that came out and everybody, and it, this is whatever you consistently think of, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And it's to me, it's all woo-woo. I do get this, that there's some science behind it. I really mm -hmm. do. 
but it's not the woo woo. Not I think about money and therefore yeah, money yeah, comes yeah. showering out of the heavens. But I do believe that if you consistently focus on what is negative in your life, you will not attract. That's the wrong word. Manifest that because there's an Afrikaans saying sort suk sort. You know, mm. so if I'm depressed, I'm going to go to a depressed person and we're going to be depressed together and we're going to mm. find another depressed person. And, mm. and so we create this negative feedback loop. So that's how we, always how I've understood it. Am I on the right track? Okay, so, so it depends on the layers. So we, we started with a very basic layer. The very basic layer is a physical, uh, a physical layer and there's cause and effect and things are reasonably predictable. And, um, but fortuitously people get ill and die and other people don't so yes. that's the most basic level the mechanistic level the next level and that's of, just happenstantial yeah so we accept that I mean that's the environment that statistically we speaking up. at some point you're going to have a car yeah so, so we, this is the Your environment that we were brought gonna, up in and yes. this is what we believe and that's it but the next level is this thing called psychoneuroimmunology which is abbreviated to PNI where we've shown that certain mind states give rise to chemical conditions such as chronic inflammation which can cause you serious illness and can kill you and that belief sits right at the top of that and that is um, well in fact belief is the next level because belief if you're actually caught up in the reflex side of it I can see it in you but you may not see it I can yes, see that I, you've yes. lost something, you've gone into hopeless, helpless. I tell you, you better be careful because I know that hopeless, helpless are going to convert you into negative chemistry. You don't see it. Which is going to take you, you might accept it or not. If you don't, you're a mechanist and you're going to die by it or survive by it, whatever. But yeah. it's going to be by chance. It's pretty statistical. But if you buy in what I'm saying, you believe what I'm saying, you've notched up your next level of awareness. You're now aware that there is cause and effect at a higher level. I got you. So I can now change my perception, my belief, and get a different consequence. So I now become involved in my wellness or my illness. Yes. Okay. I become responsible. So that's the next level. So, so illness is not that fortuitous anymore. Illness now becomes a reflection of a mind state, of an emotional state. Okay. Th and that so, makes so sense So now too. you're a player in the process, and therefore the cause and effect is a bigger picture, and it's g empowered you to be more involved in the consequence now we go into a quantum physics space okay now if you go into a quantum physics space um we know there's an energy equivalent for all physical matter that's e equal to mc squared that's pretty straightforward sure so that we all have an energy equivalent now this energy equivalent exists all the time and we know it does because it's been proven so this energy space is in our midst the whole time we're part of it as we are in a physical environment okay the only thing is it's pure energy and in a pure energy environment there's no cause and effect there's resonance in other words twang a tuning fork of c and another yes. middle because c because energy can't be it. destroyed or created no, 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 not even going there just just the packet of energy okay resonates so energy resonates with similar energy Okay. Or similar energy causes other energy to resonate. In other words, if the frequency is the same, they resonate together. Okay. That's not cause and effect. That's resonance. So coming back to this physical environment, knowing that we all have representation in a physical environment, we will resonate with either people or f or f or things or consequences. Yes. Which are resonant <laughs> with who we are. Oh, our belief system or our current emotional state okay, okay so, we, so so you so we don't say emotional system i mean uh, belief system we say emotional state in emotional state so so i say to you um i'm in a positive emotional state actively ergo i will resonate people not just people but th consequences so, okay. so, so so take a take a person who's going through a really bad patch they're in a real dark abyss they're in hopeless helplessness suddenly in their environment the electric gate seizes up the geezer bursts and they get retrenched mm. okay. and you see how you did that in three right. nothing nothing <laughs> yeah, in three. and nothing <laughs> they didn't want that to happen yes no one wants that to happen but it resonates with where they're at so calamity resonates with calamity so, so hold on is that is that because because i'm in that emotional state something will happen right Happenstantially, and because I'm in a negative emotional state, I will take that on. Or are you actually saying that because I'm in a negative emotional state, 
I can manifest the physical thing to happen. You didn't manifest the thing. No, that just happened, happened You resonated with stuff which is resonant with who you are at that point Correct. in time. So I focus on it and it becomes all encompassing. Oh, look at me. These things always happen to me. That you type can of do that's going to make it worse, but you don't even have to do that because you didn't actually materialize your hijacking because you were in a bad state. Okay. You were in a bad state. You may have been in a lethal state. And you you resonated with an event, which is resonant. With oh, I where see. You're that at. has the energy resonance with my energy resonance. Correct. Oh, jeez, like it. Right. And you and believe that to be true? Not just believe. This is proven. Okay. Okay. So, so, so I'm, I'm not going to so argue. In a, in a, quantum, you, in a quantum environment, it's been shown that human consciousness, just our engagement with something with energy, brings it into physicality. So human consciousness, when it engages, brings something that is only potential. Yes, and you're talking about reality. the observer effect. Yeah, yes, which is com confirmed. Yes, so, we know so, the observer so, effect. So is we anybody? are basically yes. manifesting physicality, reflecting our conscious state, which includes our cognit our cognition, and our emotion. Holy shit! So then, then you look at people, you turn around and say, "Oh, that guy's always so lucky," or well, is he always so lucky then? Or is it his emotional well, we state? Know. We don't know. I mean, maybe the And I don't mean just lucky, but yeah. there's certain things that, there's certain people that positive things always happen and other people that Fine. negative things. Absolutely. But, so here comes you, you brought up the book, The Secret, which is a total nonsense. But yes, it's woo, -woo. Concept, I, I refer to no, it. No, but the concept is very interesting because it, it, it raises the discussion. Okay. Based on what I've just said to you now, um, when you conceptualize, and we talk about this energy environment that we're all part of. When you conceptualize, is all you putting in that space the concept? Okay. The answer is no. The thing that you are putting into that energy space is everything that you are at that point in time. So the guy who desperately wants something also fears not getting it. Yes. So what you're putting in that space is the desperate need for it, in other words, the want. And simultaneously. And the fear of not getting it. Yes. And if the fear is strong enough, that's what you're It'll not going to get. It'll override. Yeah, because you've resonated. So consciously, because we also know that our conscious thoughts versus our subconscious thoughts are two completely different things. So consciously, I'm thinking of this positive thing, but subconsciously, there's just an absolute bombardment of negativity and fear. That's all that you are. Yeah. It's all that you are. Your subconscious. Oh, I couldn't agree more with you. So, so you're not. Just, I teach this. You're not. You're not just putting what's. I mean, you know, from you're a your, sum factor of your events and from your, your habits and addictions. Point of view, what is consciousness? I mean, we're not get caught up in Freud's conscious and uncon unconsciousness, but in a neuroscientific environment, what is conscious? Conscious is the thing that is most neuroactive at that point in time. A singular point in time. So I've got a searchlight, and. There's a whole lot of memory banks or a whole lot of circuitry. Yes. The thing that is conscious at any one point in time is the most energized circuit or the one that I put my light on at that point in time. Okay. It doesn't mean to say that none of the others are working. Of course, they're working all the But this is the guy that I'm actually fo focusing on at that point in time or it's most energized at that point in time. Okay. That's conscious. Yes. And everything else is unconscious. Yeah, I, there I agree with you. So, I mean, so, I, I teach this. So, so, okay, some of it might even be suppressed. Yes, that it might means, be that means That means it's in another department. Okay, where would you put that? Because that's not unconscious. Well, it's there. No, no, it's not unconscious. It's, it's there. It's subconscious, but, but it's I've just... I've locked it. Yes. I physically locked it away. So I've deprived myself of access to it. Yes, I've deprived myself of knowing why it is that my subconscious is making that decision. This is just one problem. Okay. It's got wiring that's still coming into the main. Oh, oh no, of course. The, the DB board is still the feeding. The DB board still feeds you, but the door's closed and you don't have the lock. But it's still feeding and, into the and, DB board. And this is where Freud talks about the shadow work. So, so yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's my sort of take on conscious and unconscious. Wow. What a, th this has already just become my favorite podcast ever. <laughs> I don't often listen to my podcast, but I'm and gonna I, go I'm, back and I'm, listen I, to this I one. I didn't sort of intend this. You know, the funny thing is um, every discussion, every workshop, that I've given, every discussion that I've had, um, always takes on its own theme, its own atmosphere, its own direction. Mm. Agreed. And it doesn't really matter 
that I've been giving, I've been giving a certain workshop. I, I give workshops at the Buddhist retreat, uh, the Buddhist retreat in 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 Ikopa. Oh, in Ikopa, so, in so KZN, I, I, eh? Yeah, I, I, oh, I wow. do two a year. So I do two a year, and I have done for nine years. Oh wow! And and every one of them, it's the same content, but they're invariably very different groups. Yes. And it the discussions yes. and the energy is completely different. Absolutely. And I come out of there as though I've attended a new workshop every yes. time. I agree with because you Because invariably I get taught, I'm not the only teacher, I get taught by the guys who have engaged in the in the workshop. Yes. In the retreat. Yeah. And so I, I find it fascinating. I mean, I came along here today. I had vague ideas of the, of the kind of concepts that I usually deal with. You basically just, you know, it's like not a note you hit like two chords i mean you've actually hit <laughs> all the notes at the same time so i'm finding myself here talking about neuroscience psycho neuroimmunology quantum physics which are the foundations of my workshop the book um, and most of what i do on a weekly basis and i'm fascinated with it and i said to you before this podcast you know i'm fascinated with what you've been doing um, and I'd like to actually get on to how it is now that we've gone down our little rabbit holes. Um, and, and thank you for that, because this is really what it's about. But how it is that you actually, so you're, you're a neurosurgeon and you're currently still a practicing neurosurgeon. You're at Linksfield Clinic, right? And then you are um, the, a, a director of a company called Neurosurge. Now, you're a neurosurgeon. And from there, I mean, if we just go down this list, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous in terms of what you've been doing with your life. But... But you started a spinal clinic um, um, in 2000. I mean, you, you did private neurosurgical practices from 1988. But um, in 2005, you developed the first online PNI or neurodiagnostics program. So neuro, psychoneuroimmunological diagnostics program. Yeah. How did that come about? And, and what led you to... Uh, I can see that it came from very far yeah, back and, and your questions, but what made you go okay i'm a practicing neurosurgeon and now yeah. what i actually want to delve into is business yeah so, so this is a very this is a convoluted path but it was in retrospect it was inevitable okay so i was the big key here was psychoneuroimmunology in other words the 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 consciousness influence the mind influence on wellness that was the big yes, one because uh, so so can we break up do you mind if mm. i just ask you to break up the word psycho neuroimmunology okay. because immunology immunology has obviously got to do with well-being yeah closely linked to the central nervous system uh, okay so, so i'll Please you explain you. So, so yes. psycho is the psychological level obviously yes cognition and emotion cognitive and emotion um which we would say from a neuroscientific point of view are sitting in the high centers of the brain prefrontal cortex and okay. the emotional centers um the neuro part are the neuro pathways correct the neuro which are neuroendocrine now there was the endocrine system neurological outflow which is through the spinal cord and all the nerves and the autonomic and uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and then the chemistry the chemistry of the brain actually goes into circulation okay and and that if then has an effect on the immune system which is a system that protects us against inf uh, infection, essentially. And, and, and in tumors. this instance, and inflammation. Tumors. No, 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 it does protect us. It's part of the inflammation. Okay. So, so basically, the immune system protects us against foreign bodies and organisms and against foreign cells. So it protects us against cancer. It kills cancer cells. And if there's anything wrong with your immune system, it lays you open to the development of illness, cancer, and infection. Okay. Because you're not protected. But the immune system, its first line of defense is inflammation. So it calls other cells and chemistry to fight whatever it has okay. to fight. So that's inflammation. Like a rugby scrum. If it's not controlled and it gets perpetuated, you get chronic inflammation. In other words, inflammation okay. that's inappropriate. Shouldn't be inflammation because there's nothing to fight anymore. So... so, so uh, it, the inflammation stocks as a protection mechanism. Yeah. It protects you from whatever it it's was. It's the first line of all the immune system's got to offer yes. to protect you against bugs. A, a, a and, foreign object. And, and bad now cells. you're saying that that foreign object is, is diverted and taken care of, but for some reason the inflammation isn't dissipating. Well, we know the reason. Your okay. mind state. The, okay, so and you it's usually the emotional side of your mind state, a, a hopeless, helpless mind state. Okay, will I see produce certain chemistry, which has been associated with it, which then 
perpetuates the chronic inflammatory part of your immune system. And you get left with this chronic inflammation for months and years. And out of that's going to come illness. So being un- terminally unhappy at work can actually lead to illness. Absolutely. Well, we've seen it. I mean, so, so let, get, getting on to the quantification. Yes. So, Why did you? Yes. So, so this Sorry. is in the clinical environment. So I, I then started using the, uh, an application. I developed an application. Yes. Um, I did NLP and I used an application which is based on NLP. And your NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. That's correct. And I then used this application to supplement my conventional neurosurgery. Okay. To alleviate both inflammation and tumors because I'm dealing with both. Okay. I'm dealing with chronic inflammation. I'm dealing with tumors. And so those who bought into it, in other words, believed it, so that was the chemistry of belief enhanced their immunity post-operation pre and post okay so in the book you'll see there's several patients that are both removed tumors on and they became successful clients in neutral neutralizing the mind state which gave rise to the condition in the first place <laughs> wow okay so that's what i was doing for a couple of years um in the clinical environment and then my patients who are corporate based said hang on a bit this application can be seen also to enhance performance. And that's general working performance, yeah, so, leadership so performance. So you need, these are the mind states and the emotional states which would enhance performance. So it morphed subtly from pure wellness enhancement to wellness and performance enhancement. Okay. And then a half a step away came leadership enhancement. So that came, it became wellness, performance and leadership. So that takes us then to around about 2000, 2005 thereabouts. And then the guys were saying, hang on a sec, you got to start measuring this because it's a difficult concept and we need to know number one where we're at to start yeah after you've done your intervention how how successful is it yes and we need to track it so along came a diagnostic which was originally pretty basic with more input and more data became fleshed out significantly then three of the coaches that i trained did master's degrees on my diagnostic so they then validated the diagnostic. Oh, wow. So the diagnostic became a validated diagnostic with seriously strong academic legs on big, big figures. So in other words, I think the one, the one coach, I think she had, I can't remember exactly, I think about 3,000 diagnostics. So big samples. We're talking about big samples validated the diagnostic. So then the diagnostic got fleshed out a little bit more. And then in about 2012, the diagnostic was established. Mm. Then came an interesting time in my life where, and I've been giving corporate workshops and doing uh, C-suite consultations, um, one-on-ones and that type of thing, feedback on the diagnostic, because each person does a diagnostic. And then I got involved in the mining sector in North America and the mining sector, Australian-owned mines in, in Turkey. And what they had was they had algorithms for the stuff in the ground that they were mining okay and the the transportation so they had to get a match between what they were pulling out the ground and the transportation to make sure that the trucks were optimally filled so they didn't waste money on empty trucks or not enough trucks but the algorithm that was missing was the people algorithm they got wind of what i was doing and so my thing then morphed into the algorithm for the people that plugged into the big algorithm of productivity so i was now able to start generating indices we call them indices yes of course so i was actually generating big data so i could now generate big data on the intangibles the meaning and purposefulness in the job situation um resilience in terms of when things go wrong self-esteem self-efficacy um self-worth in the work unit these type of things that weren't quantifiable quantifiable were now what quantified in the diagnostic yeah we were now able to start um looking at groups the group indices the divisional indices the company indices and because we were now doing more and more companies we now could profile companies against against the 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 spectrum the range and an average and tell them if they're successful or not <laughs> Shit. and we could <laughs> track we could track so in other words we have the data we've got the algorithm so we can track we can track individuals, we can track work units, we can track divisions, we can track the entire company. We can actually track um, senior management against employees. 
we can actually start seeing the dynamic. In other words, if there's a mismanaged um, person for a job or worse, a mismanaged supervisor or senior manager. Agreed. Then Agreed. we could see by the diagnostic of the employees or the the workers in that group that there's a mismatch because they would be getting were becoming more and more uninspired in what they were doing. They were actually individually going into hopeless, helpless. And the only one that seemed to be enjoying life was the supervisor uh-huh. because they were basically psychopathic. People so don't leave bad even, jobs, they leave they bad managers. They were not empathic to the needs of the people. In yes. any case, they were only out for themselves. We could also see if there was a mismatch of the person for the job description. You could see them plowing. They had enormous potential, but they're plowing into hopeless, helpless. Their self-worth was good because they knew they were, that they were worthy people, mm. but their fulfillment and motivation in the job was flagging. It was dropping down. So just by looking at the diagnostic of the individuals, of the work units, the divisions and the groups, and the whole company, we could actually, with a pretty good degree of accuracy, um, be able to establish the diagnostic for this whole group. (laughs) And I mean, we've done some big groups. I mean, I've done a bank of seven divisions of about 130 in each division. So we could actually track each division. We could comparatively. And we could actually then we can dice and spice. So we can actually compare within a silo, from the top right down to the bottom, across silos. So we can actually do middle management against middle management in each silo. Mm-hmm. We can take senior management and we can take directors, in fact, and compare them at the other against. The, that's a very sensitive place. Of course, so we can see who's inspiring who. You kidding so, me? So so. So this is where we are today. But I mean, at the end of the day, big data is big data. Yeah. And once you've got the data, yeah. Yeah. Well, then you can play. So that's what we do. So, so we've got, so we run, um, we've got diagnostics running all the time. So we've got people using our diagnostics. And, and, and sorry, just because we haven't actually yeah. discussed this. Um, this is your company, Neurosurge. That's Neurosurge, yeah. Yeah, which you started in? Uh, well, Neurosurge. So Neurosurge more from many other companies. So mm. it was previously called, what was it previously called? I can't even remember what we were previously called. Um, our partners came and went and eventually I decided you know what this is all my stuff so I'll just take it under my wing Okay. and so Neurosurge was when I said you know what guys everyone went their own way they had other things to do. I said right I'm taking Neurosurge it's mine and I'm going to just develop it I actually developed the big data component of Neurosurge from the diagnostic on my own so I worked with my companies and the coaches that stayed with me um, and from that we developed the big data so the big data is purely neurosurgeon's development. Before that was the diagnostic um, in, in the previous manifestations of the company, the previous forms of the company. It was me developing it all the time, but I had yes, partners you, and different people that were on the business side and, and different on the inputs. coaching side. But the development was mine alone since 92. And the big data then came at the end when I, I had to rise to the next level because the guys wanted mm. big data. And so... Today, um, the diagnostic is being used all the time. The database expands all the time. And with it, um, well, we've got an enormous database at the moment. Can you imagine? And it's on two servers. It's running in the UK and the, U- and the US. And they mirror servers. So it's also, for, obviously, for security. For reasons. redundancy, yeah, of course. So uh, we back up. But and apart from just the backup, we're running two mirror servers the whole time. And it's just expanding as we speak. So we've got enormous data um, for lots of things if we want to do it. And in fact, I encourage the coaches that, that, you know, if you've got a degree and you want to go for a master's, there's unlimited data here. And I'll help you. I'll tell you which direction the next one has to go. Um, the last one was leadership entrepreneurship. That was the last um, master's. The one before that was um, uh, the, 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 the archetypes, which are the, the, the backbone of the program, the, the three archetypes. Um, and illness. So that was a big one. That was used about 3,000 cases. And then before that one was measuring up our diagnostic against existing diagnostics in the marketplace. And we got a one-to-one correspondence. Wow. Bearing in mind that they're all pure psychometrics. Yes. Mine came out of psychoneuroimmunology. Yes. And yeah, came you, to the same space. Re- same outcome. Yeah, so, so neurosurge is the integration of neuroscience and psychoneuroimmunology. So if you put the, the, the cognitive, emotional stuff together with the immune system and for that matter performance, you come out with 
wellness performance and leadership based on then integration of neuroscience and PNI. Wow. So, so we've covered all the bases. So on the scientific legs, and I've had to write an article then, well, I did it a couple of years ago, where I had to show where this application comes from. Of course. So today online, you can see the neuroscience and the integration with PNI and the application all in one big article of about, I think it's about 45 pages. So the first half is hard neuroscience for those who want to look at the hard neuroscience foundation for what Correct. I do. And the second part is the neurosurge application, which is called the triangles model, which is the neurosurge application. The triangles model, by the way, came back all the way from 1992. Yes, and I was going to ask, what is that? So the triangles model, it's very complicated to explain <laughs> just like this. The triangles so, model, sorry for asking. And the words are going to be terrible. Okay. My response is going to be terrible. It is a statistical analysis of um, the way the brain handles data which takes on a triangular configuration. It turns out to be triangular. Okay. So, so that's based on the neuroscience of perception, specifically in the visual cortex. So it, it becomes triangular in configuration. And what that means is that the ground floor, when the data first arrives, goes to very non-specific filters. Over that comes less amount but more specific receptors until you get right to the apex which is the least amount of cells but responsive to the greatest amount of data okay so that gives you a triangular configuration and it's almost like a filtration process through, and that's through how we each. that's how we, de we deal with data except there's another component to this just to make it really oh, thanks. complicated thanks thanks and that yeah. is that our cognitive subjective cognitive function feeds back onto these triangles because we influence okay. what we allow in. Yes. So what we allow in, what we, what our subconscious. Yes, exactly right. yes. So, so ultimately, perception is a bottom-up triangle, influenced by top-down influence, which decides ultimately what gets to where. And in the, the the picture in my head was just the Morgan David, just because I'm seeing the two. <laughs> no, 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 it's a hell of a hell of a more complicated than that. I know, but so, I'm just so, seeing the two come so, together. So, so, yeah, start, yeah. Look, so it's we these two. Develop, we develop the triangles model in the workshop. Okay. So we slowly get there. You you ask the question one of bang in the middle of the workshop. So what we do is we build it up from the chemistry, and once we've defined the chemistry, we define archetypes. Once we define archetypes, we start working out how they see the world. And are there standard archetypes? There are three archetypes. Okay. Which are? Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you've and, called and them? I didn't call them that. I, 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 I didn't even call them that. I, I called them type 1, 2, and 3. Okay, and that the, sounds the far more said, scientific. And the corporate said, no, no more types 1, 2, and 3. I said, okay, fine. Alpha, a, Bravo, and Types a Type A, type B, type C. Said, Not a chance. No more types A, B, and C. I said, okay, fine. You know what, guys? You call it what you want. Call them what you want. And... <laughs> Alphas became Alphas, Bravos became Bravos, and Charlies became Charlies. Okay. Would your Alpha coincide with the typical uh, societal Alpha? No. Okay. My Alpha okay. will be okay. your fully aware, um, empathic, successful leader. That's your Alpha. Okay. So that's... Uh, the, big word on sensitive empathic um sees the bigger picture that's gotcha. that's our alpha our bravo is the driven bit of narcissistic okay. driven successful insensitive my way the highway my 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 needs come first okay that's your bravo fear of failure big yes. fear of failure Charlie is low self-esteem. What's gotcha. it all about? Hopeless, hopeless. And you know what's really interesting is society predicts these these alpha and they call them beta males. Okay. And their alpha and beta are the reverse of your alpha and bravo. Okay. 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 Whereas the alpha male is this narcissistic, go-getter, choleric, temperamental, you know, choleric. And your, your beta male would still be that guy, but not as narcissistic and driven, yeah. maybe prone to something called feelings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So yours is literally reversed to what society will tell you. Okay. I didn't know that. I mean, I, 
when, whenever I, whenever I just, I, even in the workshops, guys would always ask me questions, but does this correspond with, does this correspond with? Yeah, we're and trying I to say, create our frame of reference. And I say, guys, you must do whatever you need to do. <laughs> you guys must do whatever you need to do to, to, to make sense of this. Yeah. At the end of the day. But I'm, that makes perfect sense to me, what you said between Alpha, Bravo, and And obviously Charlie. we don't, they're not fixed. In other words, we have a continuum. Of course. So we have an Alpha to Charlie continuum. You, you, well, ultimately the idea is to take a Charlie to a Bravo and a Bravo to an Alpha. Absolutely. That's the goal. That's it. So that's that's really what it's about. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Wow. And so with a whole lot of stuff in between. And also that when we reach the Alpha Bravo Charlie stage of the workshop, yes. the guys all know exactly what their chemistry is. Okay. They know their chemistry and they know their nurture background. And, and would that be very private? So I've determined my, my state I don't know. Your 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 diagnostic is yours. Yes, yes. So that would be a so, very so private diagnostic. So okay? basically, because I want, I want everybody to know that I'm no, a Charlie. No, no. Look, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you one thing. The backbone of neurosurge is confidentiality. I've got you. It is absolutely inbuilt in everything that we do. Coaches can have access to their own personal clients if their clients allow them allow them to really so your client can actually actually decline eh? the client can say you know what i'll do the diagnostic for myself but you can carry on coaching the coach will say you know for effective coaching i'll need to have eyes on your and no well that's the client's the client's gonna have to give permission yeah yeah in the corporate no one sees that diagnostic except the person themselves yeah i can it's password controlled and it's their own password and it goes to their email or the email that they've, they, they've delegated, and no one sees anyone else's diagnostic. That is absolutely yeah sacrosanct in our in our business. Hmm. And believe me, there have been attempts. You, oh, you I have can no imagine. Yeah, there have been attempts at getting hold of diagnostics, and you won't believe it at which level, at the highest levels. Really, I have had a CEO approach me at tea time. I was doing a board mediated a board mediated workshop and mediation, followed by which was going to be one on ones. And at T, the CEO came to me and said, "Any chance of getting hold of a diagnostic on so and so?" And I looked, I was absolutely amazed, and I said, "Absolutely, yeah. If so and so actually gives you written consent, gives me written consent to give you his diagnostic." You say that though, but. If, if, if I'm the, I mean, I was group managing director for a group of companies and I can understand why I'd want to see the diagnostics of one of my managers. I mean, to me, that actually does make a little bit of business sense. So I see it from that side. Um, I see it from your side where you obviously don't want to give that information out, but I'd well, want I to know I, what my managers are. No, absolutely. But I can so tell you. I would want to I'll know how to manage them. I'll give you a profile of a group. I'll give you a grid, which we do. I'll hmm. give you a printout. The, the, the data is going to generate a grid. It's going to be an anonymous grid. Okay. But you're going to see the spread of your company. If you give me managers, you'll know that that's the manager's grid. If you give me a, a silo, that's the silo grid. If you give me less than five people, I won't give you a grid. Because you can't formulate one. No, because you're going to start working out. <laughs> I've got you. So I'm not going to give you a grid of five and less. Okay. So, so, so I know So really tricks. you work within the, the space tricks. of anonymity. But I do, see, I mean, I get it why. I, I can tell you now, if I ever slacken on the confidentiality side of, of the of the of the diagnostic your business is over we finished because in yeah. fact yeah. no one even even if we're still going no one is going to give an authentic answer to the questions we're not going to profile correctly yeah. because the guys know that this is not safe so if they know that their diagnostic is going to go to their supervisor manager or director's eyes sure they're not going to be honest with you that's it finished we and, and this is a self-reporting diagnostic so we actually go to the to the lengths where we get individuals to sign, and we sign that this is a confidential diagnostic. Mm. Brilliant. And we've retained that, and that is it. It's confidential. Yeah. Not being and, and I'm assuming, I'm assuming, but I'm just asking. You know, uh, <laughs> you. I'm assuming that the the diagnostic tool has taken into account uh, all these variables that Absolutely. that because when I do these bloody things, Ian, mm. let me tell you. Man, and it's look. I'm it's, it's human nature to fiddle. I'm severely, severely, severely ADHD, right? And along with OCD, and I found out why when I spoke to my educational psychologist on one of the previous podcasts, and insomniac, and and all the results of this ADD. And doing these things to me, sometimes I get caught up in 
what it is that I'm trying to achieve as opposed to just yeah. answering the yeah. goddamn questions yeah. because that's the way my brain works. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you've asked me that question. Are you referring to this week? Are you referring to last month? Are you referring to last year? Are you referring to an incident that happened this morning? I hear you. I, and, and, and when I'm yeah. doing it, you know, when I do, do, used to do, especially MB, like MBTR, right? Um, with my my, my, uh, my HR manager, she just write down the first thing that comes to mind. And I'm like, that doesn't work with me. No, no, but I hear, I, and I identify with this. And that is absolutely correct. And so you have to be primed to a degree on how to answer it, which we do. Okay. It's, pri it's primed so in the it's, instruction. So it's guided, which I like. It's guided in the instruction. I like, I like, I like, I like that. And I need the guidance. other thing that we've done is we changed the format of the questions. So... We've got my programmer has got a patent, a world patent on what he's done in our diagnostic. So oh, wow. we, we, we turn things around a little and we put it in a completely different format. Um, I can tell you the programming took weeks to get th these two questions going. And it's about rearranging the order of who you are and how you see yourself and how you think others see you. Yeah. Now, to program that. That, and, that, that is, sounds ridiculous. And he got a patent on this. So wow. there's, a, there's, a, there's an IT programming patent on this Sheesh. diagnostic. But the diagnostic leads into something even more fascinating. Okay. And, it's, and it's something that, for some reason, we've ended up sort of punting the diagnostic and neurosurgery is its diagnostic, but there's something much more powerful. It's called eModulate. And eModulate's also online. Okay. It's also sold online. E-modulate is an entire self-coaching self template. It basically, depending on your answers, takes you into different directions. If it senses that you've got a low self-esteem, it takes you into a self-esteem space. If it judges that you are in need to be in control or narcissistic, it takes you into a different direction. We, If you are totally integrated and authentic and self-actualized and a happy chappy, in the higher alpha bravo range. Or you mean like five percent of the world you will population? Be, you will finish the e modulate in three minutes flat. If you got issues, you could be still working on it an hour later, because the back pages that come up, depending oh, wow. on what your answers are, just go on and on. Oh wow! By the time you're finished and you can print the whole thing out, yes, there is your session. Somewhere Holy shit! In, in in at at strategic places along e modulate my um, commentary will come up. So in other words, it's all pre-programmed. So if someone's coming down this direction, they need this. Yeah, IFTT. And so I come in there. And, and that also gets printed out with what you've already answered. So at the end of the day, e-modulate E modulate Sounds took fascinating. about three months to program. I can't, I'm going to go try it. So you're welcome to. I mean, if you're welcome to try these. And you'll see what, what these things are all about. So we Sounds basically took um, a program and we we basically electrified. The whole, the whole thing is electronic. The whole thing is electronic. So distance learners can actually do the entire program. And, and let me ask you something, Ian. Is this based on Huntley Smith sitting there going, hmm, I'd really, specifically e-modulate, right? I'd really like to take a deeper look at myself. And, and, and it's always great to have that that outside and, and let me tell you electronics even better because now they don't have to interact with humans yeah. which is even better yeah. or is this focused on the, the managing director of a company getting a department together or a, 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 a let's say their management committee together and saying right guys let's focus on this as a task for the business well look up until now e-modulate is a personal thing okay yeah this is a personal tool all right it's so e-modulate is personal is whereas coaching whereas but, uh, but the the diagnostic the, the, although it starts off being very personal and it always remains very personal it, it we is, take the data. I've got you. So you that's use that. Okay. So our data feed is the individual doing the diagnostic. I've got the you. more people in an organization doing the diagnostic, the more data we've got. Mm. And the more accurate our evaluation and the more accurate our tracking. So we, we need to track these guys. So we track guys. We say don't not under three months and usually about six months is a good tracking period. If intervention's been done, yes, in in six months, it's a good tracking period. Yeah, because there's no point to just give me the information. Yeah, so we track it. We, we need track to it. six months is great because you've already forgotten a lot of the questions, <coughs> and um, but it also the guys remain pretty authentic. I must tell you, our our fiddle with our diagnostic is a very low percentage. 
We know that because when we've gone into When you role, say fiddle, what do you mean by that? Giving the wrong answer just to boost yourself. Oh, In the self-reporting, boosting yourself uh, oh, I see what you're saying. fictitiously. And, and well, how we A know fiddle. that, okay. how we know that is because in most of the companies that we've done, they'll do the diagnostics before the workshop. Then after the workshop, we do one-on-ones. And one-on-ones is based on the diagnostic. So now I'm the coach, so I've got access to your diagnostic because it's already agreed that I've got access to your diagnostic. You come in with your diagnostic. I look at your diagnostic. If I, I, can, if I start the interaction with you, I can immediately tell you ah, whether if you've or not. diverged from this diagnostic. Got you. Because a guy that walks into the room who's an Alpha Bravo, which, by the way, we get, we've got no pure Alphas. The highest okay. we've ever got is Alpha Bravo, and you get ranges of Alpha Bravo. So, oh, okay. So, within, so the highest so, we've got is a, oh, wow. a, a, an Alpha Bravo very rarely gets to 80%. So the highest Alpha Bravos we get are 75s. And so if I see on a diagnostic a seven, an Alpha Bravo at 75, the, the this, guy that I'm expecting to walk into this room <laughs> is be very chilled and he's highly... He's got an enormous self-esteem. He's 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 chilled. He's at ease. He's successful. He's happy. He's content. He's looking forward to the next challenge. That stub a guy, and he sits down, and the body language is exactly that. Yes. He slouches over the chair and said, "How's it going? How's the program going?" That type of stuff. Yeah. If a guy walks in that's tight, grim-faced, sits down, and he's defensive, got you. His body he's language. Got a big problem. This yeah. is a liar. This is a borderline person. Liar, liar. <laughs> Borderline personality, we don't have to go any further. Yeah. There's a serious, let's call it a disconnect. And so, so talking about borderline personalities, what the hell happens if you deal with somebody who's bipolar? Yeah, but hang on a sec. Borderline, we've got to define what we mean by borderline personality. No, we may, we I'm may, not we, talking about schizophrenia because I no, don't no, we're think... we're talking about... Okay, here lies the problem. Yes. Semantics. Borderline personality often refers to a sociopath. Okay. Okay, so... Sociopath is sociopath stroke psychopath. Mm. The difference between a psychopath and a sociopath is a sociopath hasn't killed anyone yet. Okay. So, so, <laughs> sure. so, 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 that let, just let, went down dark. So, so, so let's just leave that out. Okay. You're talking about someone with what, multiple personalities? No, or, or somebody who's bipolar. I mean, I personally know two wonderful people that I've known for a very long time, both of them are, are bipolar. And so they may have answered, the done the diagnostic when they were in the positive That's side. That's what I'm trying and to say. Yeah. And they're coming in on the negative yeah. side. I'll, I'll pick it up. Okay. I'll pick it up very quickly. Yeah. Because so that wasn't fact, a trick question. That just ca- so, you- so in fact, if they are sensitive, empathic individuals, and they answered as such, and they come in and they're going through a really dark phase, We'll start talking and the empathy will still come through. Because mm. it's there. It'll, it's there. Yeah, It'll just come through. It needs a little bit of inspiration. But their positive side will still come through with I've a little you. bit of inspiration. I've got you. Yeah. So, on to the next thing I'd like to discuss. At what point did you decide that now I need to write a book? And for what reason? Well, look, I've written a couple. So, <laughs> okay. so, so the first book so was the book in that, the 90s. Okay. So, so that was Quantum Leap, and it was a bestseller. Why? Because... Oh, really? Yeah, it was a best. The reason why it was a bestseller is because um, it came at a time when we were on carte blanche. So who was we? Me and a patient. Okay. So I used the program on a patient who had no prognosis. She had several secondary brain tumors in her brain and her chest. Okay. Her prognosis was six weeks. The medical profession could do nothing for her. I used PNI only on her, and the tumors dissolved. Wow. And she had disseminated melanoma. And why it was so mind blowing was because I had the scans. I collected every month's scans. I did a scan on her every month. Okay. So you had the data? So we had the data and we had the before and after. There they were, nine months apart. Yeah, here's the science, here's the facts. So we went on carte blanche and people just saw this and this was amazing. This is PNR on the map. Drove our room, they jammed the switchboard in our rooms. I just came out with a book, coincidentally, called Quantum Leap. At that point in time, it was bought out across the country, reprint bought out, Huge and it was on the joking. bestseller list. So that was Quantum Leap. So then there have been a whole lot of books since then. Talk, self-published. Talk, talk about some resonation. Self, <laughs> resonating. <absolutely>. Self-published <laughs> stuff. And then, so as I said to you, I've been writing <coughs> articles, articles on yes. social media and a few on my own sites and a few others. And um, I got involved with conscious companies, 
which is a great company. Conscious Companies is really about creating awareness in the corporate environment. Mm. And your book, and, sorry, I just want to say, your book is called Leading with Conscious Awareness, A Narrative of Personal Insights. And that's it. And so Brenda Carley, who is the CEO of Conscious Companies, whom I was introduced to, suddenly said, hang on a sec, hang on a bit. I'm involved with conscious companies. I'm trying to make the corporate more conscious and aware. This is the stuff. So she actually designed it, got her publishers to put it together, and this is the book. So in fact, I had no intention of writing a book. Wow. She was instrumental yeah. in making the book So she real. was the catalyst for you? She made it real. Wow. So this is this is basically the fruits of her. Look, it's my content. It's your content, yes. But it's but her it's... design. And it's her motive to say, you know what, the corporate needs this. People need this. I couldn't agree more. So, so this is a lot of stuff about very technical things, but made very lay public friendly. Yeah, made into, put into layman's terms. So this is, because it was written on social media, so it was written at that level in any case. I didn't mm. want to go and direct this yeah. to, 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 to peers and scientists and new, neuroscientists. And yeah, and you wrote it for us stupids. No, no, I wrote it for the world. In fact, I think that the, the changes don't come from the buggers that are the, the experts in the fields. And in fact, there's a whole section here called the experts in inverted commas because ah, really? they're not such experts. Yes. The, the real innovation comes from the people. So give the people some real substrate. Yes. Some, some non-fake news. Some real stuff. Ag agreed. Some truth. Some, some real stuff that you can work and, with. And also stuff that can be applicable. And they become the pressure group. Yeah. So the okay. lay public becomes a pressure group. You know what? We need change. We're in the middle of change. Yeah. We need change. So here's some, here's some substrate. Here's some material. Mm. that you can use to affect change because everything needs to change. The whole medical model needs to change. Well, l let me tell you what I'm hoping. Uh, obviously, thank you for my book. I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon. Uh, I'll get you to sign it later. But after our discussion, I'm hoping to read a book where you've actually got tangible actions because I'm so sick and tired of reading books. And at the end of it, you get to it and you go, yeah, what was that? What, 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 what I'm waiting for this, this, that, that is a point, that is a point, this is a point, this is a point. Well, look, I'm right from the beginning. It was an exploration of consciousness, but it was also because I'm a fix-it guy. Yeah, you're a, you're a so, hands-on so scientist. So how do you fix it? So everything I do and say has always got a second part. Well, how do I apply it? Yeah. How do I fix it? What's the plan? Well, I'm in the fix-it business in any case. <laughs> Indeed you are. So, so I, I'm either sort of slicing and dicing your head or your spine, or I'm slicing yeah. and dicing your diagnostic. So, so I'm working with you in your different manifestations of consciousness. For sure. <laughs> Either uh, physically or metaphysically. This is it. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, we walked in just before the podcast and you said to me, you were in a 14-hour surgery last night. Well, yesterday I did 14 hours of surgery. That's so, ridiculous. Yeah, it is. It is it, it, it's too much. It's too much. But I mean, sometimes it happens. I mean, people think that you go in and you do a scheduled procedure on a, on a, a known problem that um, it's predictable. It's be an hour and a half and that's it. Not a chance. You and, don't know and what fact, variables even after happen. look i've been in neurosurgery for 36 years i mean even at this stage of my life when what i see on a scan and what i've examined etc i have a pretty good idea of what i'm in for but even then i get a shocker because mm. hang on a sec and and then suddenly you feel the blood drain from your face and your <laughs> knees go a bit wobbly and say hang on a yeah, sec but yes the difference this you're is dealing totally with a lot different being. this is totally there's something wrong here there's yeah. something seriously wrong here um, and that happens often. Shit. So suddenly, the one and a half hour procedure became a four hour procedure. But there were three of these. So that's already 12 hours. So, so and there's, you've got to have your change over time. So mm. the day started at eight and the day finished at 10 in the night. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, that's eventually when you sent me a message. That's, that's the story. So, How ridiculous. So there's that side, yeah. Um, so there's the fix it bit. So I don't write anything unless there's a take home. Yes. There's got to be a take home. Thank you. So so the whole Thank book you. is about a take home. So where to from here? Mm. And I think the world needs where to from here. And I think the world needs goddamn obje objectivity and a little bit of clarity. You know, there's there's so much craziness going on that we need the the Ian Weinbergs and we need the Jordan B. Petersons. Um, I, I don't know if- I know if, the name. Yeah, yeah. He, he's just written an Amazon bestseller called uh, 12 Rules for Life. Okay. And we need the Gad Sads, who's an evolutionary um, psychologist going, guys, there's biology, mm. you know, and this is what the world says. And, mm. you know, we need just these rational clarifiers, mm. you know? 
Absolutely. We need to help each other. We do. We need to help each other. And we in do. fact, and that's why I say to you, you know, my two great, in fact, two great heroes and one sub hero. Um, I mean, Bruce Lipton is a great hero for me. He's a guy that went completely against the grain, challenged the biomedical model, and actually proved that there's another side to life. That the DNA molecule is not a fixed molecule, that it changes in life, and that what you think and feel and your habits in affect what your DNA expresses, Jeez, okay. and you hand it over to your kids. So yes, the way you conduct your life, but this is epigenetics. The I'm molecule, epigenetics, yes. Mo the molecule hasn't changed. But what's expressed and suppressed yes, has been changed. Because I read an interesting article that the, the DNA strand changes between healthy people and obese people. Absolutely. Yeah, so they, they, they took out the DNA strand, they, they tested it on an obese person, right? Then they took it out and they tested it on, on a healthy person. And it lit, so literally that child who was born from somebody obese would have had a bad start in life. So that's it, in, in uh, a nutshell. In a nutshell, am I that's, right? it, that's it. How crazy. Well, that's Bruce Lipton's um, okay. thesis. Okay. Bruce Lipton's thesis was that he took normal rats, fed them this ridiculous diet of high glycemic index carbohydrates. They become fat tubbies. Then they had kids, and the kids were born as fat tubbies. There we go. So that was his thesis. So well, maybe Bruce, it's the same research I'm talking about because I heard Lipton. it on a podcast. So that's Bruce Lipton, and then there's Rupert Sheldrake, who's the guy that put this energy field on the map. Hmm. Bruce Sheldrake is not a pushover. Bruce Sheldrake was on his way to getting a Nobel Prize for cell biology. He was a professor of cell biology is at Cambridge. It, so is it Bruce or, or, or Rupert Sheldrake? Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert, okay, Bruce. So he was online to getting, and then he came out with this theory of formative causation and got blown out of the scientific world oh. because they couldn't accept that one of their yes. own could be talking like this. Really? So that's Bruce, that's Rupert, Rupert Sheldrake. Sheldrake. And the third guy is Dean Radin. And Dean Radin is a physicist in California who's shown directly two years ago that human consciousness brings into reality potential energy he's how did unbelievably can you can you elaborate experiment oh really can you done. can you break it down or not hell oh, what he did was i mean he said okay basically um waveforms okay well, let's put it this way matter has a wave and a particulate form uh, yes the wave is the energy and the particulate is the mass um at any one time matter behaves either as an energy form as a wave or as or a, a particle yes as soon as you engage with it human assume assume um, consciousness engages with the, the source yes it immediately shifts it into particulate into mass always into always. mass. as soon as you engage with it it's no longer a wave it's converted okay. into so, reality. So, so it's it's either and or normally and the moment the observer effect comes into place you shift it straight it will into always go to the matter mass. state matter mass Okay, so what he does, he sets up this experiment, which are, without going into the physics no, of it. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's but called it's a double slit experiment. Yes. But he basically had remote viewers fixed on this, and they shifted it, okay. and he's got the stats. So, so, for, so my, is. for my listeners and for everybody watching, I understand what remote viewing is, but I'm sure a lot of people don't understand what remote yeah, viewing is. Yeah. C can you... Okay, so very, very briefly, remote viewing and remote effects... Um, is having an influence on something measurable when from a you're distance. not physically there and you're not able to interact with it with your five senses. Correct. So it's purely through, call it consciousness. Yeah. So somebody's sitting 600 kilometers away in a, in a room and focusing on that experiment um, and through remote viewing consciousness, creating an observer effect which took the matter, uh, the... the, the, the which took the, the, the substrate from its energy into its matter form. Holy shit. And that's was and that actually <laughs> was done. <laughs> wow. And so and then another experiment was done by two other physicists at I think it was Princeton. It's all in the book, by the way. I I i I'm obviously Every, I know the double slit experiment, but okay, I've but, never heard of the remote Yeah, so everything's in the book. The other two guys, what they did was uh, they had guys again. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact format of their experiments, but they had interactions with electronic equipment. Okay. And they were working out the statistics. Wasn't it a, 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 an ONI, a random number, gen an ONG? No, that was Nelson. So okay. it's the same department, by the way. Okay. I think it's Harvard, actually. Ra Nelson, random Harvard. number, number yeah. generator. Same department, but they had an, a few other experiments going as well. Okay. So they were looking to see the effects of human consciousness on electronics. Okay. Which they showed beyond all shadow of doubt, 
had a direct effect on electronic apparatus such as computers, etc. <laughs> so if gamers are negative, they can affect their you computers. Finished. <laughs> You're finished. It's, Listen it's to all the gamers it's out there. So, so, so they actually published this article. But, Ian, you know, all these things, uh, and and it's this is this is th- these are items that I've been curious about my whole life and looked at. And my, I mean, my fav- favorite physicist is Fred Allen Wolf. You know, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that'll tell you exactly down the rabbit holes I've gone because I mean, he's a complete fucking lunatic. But Dr. I love Quantum. him, Dr. Quantum. I, Dr. Quantum, exactly. But I love him. There's there's such a big difference between my name is Huntley. I live in South Africa. And every day I get up and I need to work and I need to slog and I need to go through some suffering and this unattainable etheric concept of quantum physics. And so many people try to bridge this because it's this out there versus, hey, but I'm right here and guess what? Tonight I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive in traffic, you, you know? And you think that neuropsychoimmunology is almost a bridge. I'll tell you what the bridge is. Okay. And this is going to be, this is another sort of like, I'm throwing a serious good wall. Okay, let's go. Let's go. I got my big girl panties on. (laughs) (laughs) The bridge is awareness. The, The greater your awareness, the less you are confined to your physical space. Okay, so depending on how far your awareness will allow you to go. So for example, you... Quantify awareness. Okay, so, so yeah, let me give you an actual experiment. Please. No, not an experiment, an actual physical reality. Okay. So in neurosurgery, in brain work, mm. we deal with what's called a neuronavigational system. So what's a neuronavigational system? It is us working, and before we started the operation, we did a scan, an MRI scan of the patient's head, and we've already marked where we're going. Okay. What the lesion is. We can even outline it. Okay. And we superimpose that on what we're doing. So what happens then, the scan comes up, we register all our instruments, and wherever we are now, we can see it on the scan. So it starts navigating for us to take us to where we need to go. Okay. Because it's superimposing the, the most recent scan on the reality of where we're working. So it's the virtual reality, but superimposed on where we are. That virtual reality, by the way, comes up under the microscope so if we're working in the microscope the main field is what we're actually seeing but in the top corner is the picture of what lies just behind what we can't see holy shit it's superimposed the virtual reality onto from the data that we took on the scan okay onto the actual picture that we're looking at okay so we can see the picture but we can also see what's around the next corner okay because that's already been factored in from the virtual reality Okay. So we're interchanging between two realities, the physical here and now in this space. And the virtual. And the virtual. Now, depending on how virtual you want to become, mm-hmm. you can pack in as much virtual as you want. Which within is your awareness. Within your awareness until the wall is no longer a barrier to me because I know what's on the other side of the wall. So I can see both sides of the wall. You may only see this side of the wall, but I can see the other side of the wall as well. That means that my awareness has given me access or freedom beyond yours. And so if I pack in more levels of virtual reality and awareness in my awareness, I'm no longer confined to the here and now. Okay. When you say pack in, could I, could I quantify that to something like knowledge and experience? That's one component. Okay, what would be other components? So my knowledge, my well, experience, well, my, my, my self-awareness. We, my we, 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 we're, talking, we're talking about here and now. Yes, so we're yes, yes, about yes. The, the here and now. So what impacts on perception of the here and now? Um, all the things you've just mentioned, where okay. I come from, my experience, um, my frame of reference. Yeah. Um, my, my filter, my lens, yeah, yeah, that, the way it yeah, comes yeah, yeah. in. But now I can add in information coming through electronic media okay of the other side of something 
Okay. Other people's view of it, interpretations of it, consequences of it. I've got you. That's AI now. So yes. AI is now pumping okay. in. You see, okay, we needed to just speak about the same thing about AI. I get exactly what you're saying. Gad said, my favorite um, 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 evolutionary psychologist, he talks about ostrich parasitic syndrome. OPS, he calls it, and he's in fact he's, he he tweeted me uh, yesterday to say to me that this book is coming out, Ostrich Parasitic Syndrome, and that is where I stick my head in the ground, right, and I literally will not consider anybody else's view. To the detriment of myself and others, it does not matter, and you're saying that it's almost going right. Let me listen to your side. Let me listen to your side. Let me listen to your side, and formulate the right information, and then formulate my ultimate truth and raise my awareness. So everything you need, and, and obviously, again, it comes back to your subjectivity. It comes back to how open you are to enhancing your awareness. Mm. So unfortunately, it comes back to square one, and that is, are you able to and prepared to see things with different eyes? Yeah. And unfortunately, different religions, yes, and different. in one of the articles you'll see, unfortunately, at the end of the day, we are subject to where we've come from. Yes. But I, I agree that we are are slaves to our environments and our genetics. I, I, I agree with that, but that doesn't mean that you can't break free as a slave. No, it doesn't mean to break free. And, and, and we always, we, we, we always engage with the belief and the hope that the that person can. can transcend. Yes. In retrospect, we know that certain people just couldn't. And they okay. could not because of anything. There's no blame. There's no fault. It's merely the fact that they are a product of a certain heritage which precluded them from being able to transcend. So we have to accept that. So, At the end of the day, not everyone can transcend. Okay, give me an example. No, guys who fail on the coaching side. If we, we basically, if we've got a really, if we've got a, a, I've a, got you. a Charlie okay. type, we've got a Charlie type who's had a most horrendous nurture environment, a, a terrible, abusive yes, yes. nurture environment. Yes, and he's environment. completely, okay, I've got you. And he's been wiped. And, and yet he's still done pretty well for who he is, or she is, but they it, don't have the intrinsic wherewithal mm. to make the a great word. transcendence. I've got you. And that's it. I've got you. And when you're talking about transcendence, you're talking about Charlie to Bravo, Bravo to Alpha. Yeah, and, and all that it, it, it implies. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, I say that very yeah. flippantly. Everything but, that but, it implies. But that's but what you're talking about. Absolutely. Awareness because you see, the problem is the moment you say quantum, right? Mm. Everybody go da goes down we wee trains. Mm. But you're saying, no, no, let's bring it back to something that is, is, is here and now. And that is um my programs and what we actually do yeah. and how we actually transcend people from a charlie state to a bravo to an alpha state yeah. okay which is what it's what i do yeah so hell at the end of the day and if i didn't succeed i'll just take out the tumor i mean yeah <laughs> you don't have to do this I mean, how do you remain a practicing neurosurgeon and run neurosurge business at exactly the same time Ach, it's many years. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's years mm. of experience and practice and prioritizing and management. And, mm. and then, and eventually I suppose you didn't write the book, but you had the articles and, and, written. And uh, yeah, and there's a space for everything if you manage it. Mm. So it's about managing. Absolutely. Um, and it's about passion. You know, passion gives that extra bit of energy. Yes, it so, does, doesn't it? And the funny thing is, I mean, I... And passion I, is infectious. And, 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 and funny enough, I... I find that I'm, I'm innovating on both sides. So the greatest innovation and development in the neurosurge side, the, the diagnostic, et cetera, happened when we co-developed the artificial spinal disc. So that was in the middle of, neuro, that was mainstream neurosurgery. Yeah. But I was, and so I was highly active on two fronts at the same time. Once you've actually gone through that, you can manage anything. So here we were, literally innovated a new artificial disc for the world it was fda approved yes um and we had to do all the trials and then start training american surgeons in south africa on how to put it in Jeez, like it's... so this was intense intense you stuff. make me feel like a charlie Ian. i'm just letting you know <laughs> no, no, but i'm an aberration i mean i i'm, I'm, no. a, I'm a total aberration please, so, so please this continue. is happening and i'm developing the diagnostic and there are worlds apart yet in my world, There's they're very close. Yes, exactly. They're very close. Would I'm be. doing the same thing in slightly Physical, different environments. Physical, yeah. metaphysical, it, or, yeah. or, 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 or psychological. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or so psychological. that was happening at the same time. Sheesh. And so my colleagues were like saying, you know, what the hell are you doing now? I mean, we've got to 
<laughs> in this case, if we've got this particular problem, what do you think? I'll get back to you. I'm just going to sort. I've got to tweak one of the questions in the diagnostic. <laughs> I'm sure you must have had a lot of frustrated partners at that stage. Yeah, well, look, it was a terribly stressful time. It was. I can imagine. You know, when you innovate something that's going to go you, into someone's body. Yes. And you take full responsibility yes. for this. And you're still happily married, so you've and, and, obviously and got a it. keeper. And this is it, yeah. Well, um, I, it's it's my wife's sort of like eyeing me with those eyes again. <laughs> now what? You know? So, on to that. Yeah. Now what? What's next? You know, I, I never plan Focus these on things. the business? It, it, it just happens. I, at this point in time, um, now on, on, the, on the medical side, um, I have this fascination with neurophysiology. So I'm sort okay. of heavily involved now with the deepest interpretation of nerve conduction studies. I've got my, my machine going and so that's a whole big new dimension in my clinical practice. Okay. It's weird. It sounds absolutely weird at this stage of my life. Yeah, you're starting I, off. I found a whole new sort of opening there. Anyway, that's another it's story. It's going to keep you going another 20 years. That's another and story. And the world needs you for another 20 that's years. That's another yeah. story. On the, on, on the PNI, on the neurosurge side, yeah, look, I, I think that at this point in time, I've got nothing in mind, but I don't have things in mind. They happen. Mm. Right now, I'm having fun with what it is. Actually, really where I would like to go now, I, I, I'd, I'd like to expand on the teaching. I think that it's enough of this thinking and developing. I'd really like to go into the teaching. Yes, I do. I do the, I do the workshops at the Buddhist retreat. I do two retreats a year and they're usually fully subscribed. I mean, mm. and we have a lot of fun and we can only take 42 people at a time because that's, it's no out, uh, no living out people. It's all living in people. Okay. You can I've only accommodate you. 42 people. And that's that's the highlight of my calendar every year. Those two, they, they're either February or August. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, off. I think the greatest service, and far be it from me to tell you what the greatest service that you can do is, but I really do believe that the greatest service that you can do is to teach other people to give this gift. Yeah. And, 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 and normally I'd be giving, I'd be training coaches. I train coaches once in Joburg, once in Durban every year. This is the first year that I'm not training. It's just been too busy. It's mm. been ridiculous. It's been the book and everything. But ultimately, I would really like to have an ongoing... It's not just for coaches. It's for people. I mean, I'd like to now open it out and say, look, I'm not training. I can train coaches, but and they have to be accredited. But I would like to open it up and now teach the lay public mm. of the content of the book, which is the book is essentially the program in its soft form. But I would like to teach because I think that the environment could benefit Massively. from the concepts. From the concepts. Massively. So yes, I'll train coaches for accreditation and they'll use the diagnostic and interpret the diagnostic for their clients. But I think the time has come. And in fact, it's, it, it's interesting that you asked me the question. I think that that's what's been sitting at the back. Mm. I, I, want to, I want to enlarge on the teaching side of it. I, th you know, I think it's the right yeah, thing to do and I'm like yeah, I said far be it for yeah, me to say that yeah. but I mean I, I'm sitting here and I don't even know how long we've been going but how, uh, how absolutely how long we've been going I'm unbelievably fascinating this conversation has been look it's been it's been you know I must tell you that well I must tell you that um, as I told you I I, I have a little I bit function of in response to <laughs> I function in response to the stimulation of the environment and, and when I've had a session like this it's a reflection of you I mean, you basically are the the fifty percent of the energy in this discussion. Yes, indeed. Okay, fine. I'm giving you substrate, but um, I warm up to energy, and and we've been at this for so long because you've inspired me to be at this level. Thank you. So that's that's I appreciate really where that. we're at. Kind words, kind words. But having said that, um, I, I I I need to move on. Hundred <laughs> percent. And it's but been it, such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Um, for everybody listening, um, leading with uh, conscious awareness, your new book. Where is it available? Um. At the moment, we're busy negotiating with the, with the um, um, with the book the bookshops. We're not happy with their terms. Okay. Um, at the moment, we're Can selling them through the practice. Okay. So the public can get them through the practice in Linksfield. All right. So Linksfield, the the consulting rooms are selling them. They okay. want eighty and, bucks. And what what practice is that? Sorry, just my practice. Which is uh, my neurosurgical practice. Okay. So What's it's Ian sorry. Weinberg? Oh, Ian Weinberg. It's Ian Weinberg at okay. Linksfield Clinic. My rooms are at one, Linksfield uh, Clinic. Number one. Uh, Got you. Uh, the room Have you thought of one. Amazon? I have, but um, it yes, and we probably have to go that route. Um, we'll have to put it into format, and I, I'd rather mm. get someone to do it. I just I need to find someone to do it. I don't have the time or I've the energy you. to do it. I've got you. We will do. We'll go that yes. route. I mean, it lends itself. And, and, and I'd like to make one more suggestion, if mm. I may, please. Again, mm. um, audio. 
Yeah. And, and I yeah. know it would take you a little bit of time to narrate this, yeah. but yeah. audio is becoming the new king. And, uh, and for me, I have audio books. I would love this. Yeah. If, if I will read this yeah. without a doubt, this book. Well, I'll tell but you I would listen I'll to tell it you what, again. You, you read it, and if you're happy with it, then you can guide me to the audio. Done. Okay, you challenge guide me accepted. the audio, you can manage the audio, and you can take a cut of the audio. <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell Ian thank you for your time I really appreciate thank it you. Thanks to all thanks the listeners I hope great. you enjoyed that as much as I did so long and thanks for the fish cheers guys thanks very much cheers alright guys um, wow what a podcast what an absolutely incredible podcast it took every single ounce of my energy just to keep up with Dr. Weinberg um, you know before the podcast he sat down and he said to me look Hans I'm a bit ADD I only think we can do an hour and I said no that's perfect well you know that's sort of what we do then and uh, <laughs> that didn't work out him and I went down some serious rabbit holes and uh, sure I had to do a lot of recalling in my memory banks of a lot of information that I sure I haven't uh, followed up for a very very long time but just what a pleasure it was to speak to Dr. Weinberg and how knowledgeable he is with regards to consciousness and the brain and the mind and, I, and I, I'm sure you guys enjoyed the podcast as much as I did um, as always um, this episode, episode of the Thought Lab podcast is brought to you by my main equipment sponsor and sound engineer Jared Smith and um, his, uh, his album She Wolf um, uh, his song from the album Charcoal Sketching um, She Wolf uh, and the music video has just been dropped on Facebook and it's just been dropped on YouTube and it's an acapella lyrical genius of a song so go check it out guys that's available on youtube and on facebook um, and this episode is also brought to you by teletrack um, thank you to Dita and the teletrack team for always supporting the thought lab podcast i really appreciate it and if you want to go check them out you can do so at www.teletrack that's t-e-l-l-y t-r-a-c-k dot com um all right guys uh, i hope you have a fantastic week um i'll catch you next week ciao bye